Welcome, Christine. Thank you for making the time. We must begin our conversation by acknowledging the tragedy that has befallen the Indonesian people and the graciousness of still hosting your meetings. I want us to focus on extreme inequality in our discussions. You know, Christine, that our report this year came out with this stat that 82% of all new wealth created last year was captured by 1% at the top and the bottom 50% got zero. Hardworking people, zero out of it. You've been a champion. You've put extreme inequality very firmly on the IMF agenda, on the global agenda, and uh, we acknowledge that. We also see it coming into your policy advice. That's great. Today, Oxfam is launching the Commitment to Reduce Inequality Index. Our index is going to measure, it's ranking 157 countries and measuring three things, three policy areas that are proven to reduce inequality. One is provision of publicly provided health, education, and social protection, progressive taxation, making the rich pay their fair share, and workers' rights. Mm -hmm. And this index, we're seeing interesting things, that some countries are actually doing the right things, like South Korea. South Korea has increased the minimum wage by 15% has rolled out social protection and is taxing the rich to pay for that. Namibia, Indonesia, they are doing, but then we see many countries complacent, even complicit in fueling extreme inequality. What's your take on this, Christine? Well, first of all, I would like to also acknowledge um, the, the um, generosity and the hospitality of the Indonesian people. Uh, just like you, I went to uh, Lombok and uh, my team went to Sulawesi to see for themselves and, and try to raise awareness and make sure that there is funding directed to the people who are suffering at the moment. So uh, I, I'm totally with you on that. We look at it as IMF and we are concerned about stability, about prosperity. So what do we do? We do research work, we try to operationalize if our research is validated and accepted, um, and uh, we try to use the traction that we have. So we have uh, done quite a bit of work now on the relationship between inequality and particularly excessive inequality, that goes to your point about extreme uh, inequality, and its impact on growth. And it's very clear from the research that we have produced now for the last three or four years that excessive inequality is certainly not conducive to sustainable growth, quite to the contrary. So we would have hoped that things would be taken up by the policymakers to address excessive inequality. We haven't seen much of that, unfortunately, because in the last three decades, I agree with you, inequality has actually increased. And it's a bizarre phenomenon because you have, on the one hand, a reduction of inequality between nations, between economies, which is good. You know, we shouldn't turn our nose against it. And, you know, when a country like China increases for all, um, you know, standard of living, it's good. Uh, but inequality within countries, including the one I just mentioned, actually, as, a, as increased and has made it worse for the poor people. So we need to find um, the ways, the narratives, mm -hmm. the, um, the ultimate arguments that will convince policymakers to go in the direction of better growth, which means eliminating excessive inequality. So uh, bottom line, excessive inequality is bad for sustainable growth. Yeah. I think you've made that point really very well. Let's talk about taxation, because it's so important to tax progressively mm -hmm. in order to reduce inequality. You know, your analysis came out with this figure that 49 low-income countries will need $520 billion every year mm -hmm. to achieve the Sustainable by Development 2030, Goals yeah. by 2030. Excellent. Now, we know from a continent like mine, Africa, that 
on average, 67% of the revenue collected is from indirect taxes, mm -hmm. regressive taxation. This is not going to take us to achieving the sustainable development goals because the burden of taxation is mostly on the poor. How are we going to make this shift, Christine, from regressive taxation towards progressive taxation? And I'm meaning taxing wealth, taxing inheritance, taxing capital gains, taxing uh, top incomes. Mm. How are we going to get there? What's your role as IMF in that? Well, I think our first role is to signal that domestic revenue mobilization is one of the big ways to go for low-income and developing countries. And this is a topic that was, and a principle that was approved in Addis Ababa when there was the meeting of all those who participated in the Sustainable Development Goals and how it would be financed. So number one is help improve domestic revenue mobilization, which means capacity building. It means the institutional capacity for member states, particularly in the low-income and developing countries, to be able to put together a tax system, go after collecting tax where it is due, uh, and fighting against tax evasion uh, of, of all sorts. That's number one. Uh, and it has a link to the next one, because it is often quicker more efficient, less difficult to collect when you increase, say, sales tax or VAT. It cuts across the whole population. It touches on consumption, which is a way where you can actually capture transactions. It is not the best taxation. Mm -hmm. I would never say that. Yeah. And it is true that other, particularly the direct uh, taxation, such as income and others, mm -hmm. are more uh, efficient in terms of redistribution. But they are more difficult to put in place, hence the institutional capacity of states to go and collect, to go and design, to identify wealth, to actually get the data available so that people do not just fiddle their you know, actual income in order to avoid the taxation of such income. But I've heard you say, Christine, that there is room for countries to tax big companies to tax rich mm -hmm. people more. Is, are you going to kind of shift this so that um, there's less reliance on VAT, so that you use your loan program to push governments to move in that direction of progressive taxation? We have two issues, the short term, the long term. In the short term, because we are called upon addressing urgent, immediate balance of payments situation where there has to be a need to instantly collect and raise fiscal revenue in order to redistribute. And that's sometimes what we have to do. And then there is the medium to long term, which is where we have to actually make sure that taxation is actually uh, raised where activity occurs. And I'm here referring to the optimization uh, plans that some big corporate accounts organize in order to evade uh, not evade, avoid taxation in certain places. Mm -hmm. And the same applies to some of the higher net worth individuals who are trying to organize themselves in such a way that they don't pay taxation where their activity, their income, mm -hmm. or their, their living occurs. So we need to couple the two. Mm -hmm. Because even if we have you know, the best direct taxation scheme in the world, mm -hmm. it is not going to happen instantly. It's mm -hmm. going to take one, two, three years. So we need to combine the two. Yeah, we're going to be with you on pushing for to, uh, towards progressive taxation. But Can I just make a point as well? Uh, it also depends on what you do with your revenue. Mm. Yes. So, yes. you know, it's all very well to say we need to have the right basis on which to assess taxation. Mm. And I'm with you on, in the medium to long term, much better mm. having more direct than indirect taxation. Mm. But it's also what you do with it. That's it. Because if you then reallocate properly, if you affect those revenues to health, to education, to programs that are going to help those who do not have access to it, then it makes a good story and Absolutely. it's valuable for people. Yeah, I agree with you entirely. In fact, our index is showing that really countries 
can make choices to reduce inequality, and some are. Yeah. For example, Senegal, we find, is spending 21% of its budget on education. 21%. Like it's Indonesia. One. Exactly. Yeah. And next door, nearby, Nigeria, which is twice as rich, with a GDP that's like twice as mm. much as Senegal's, spends just 7% of its budget on education three times less than Senegal. It's a choice. We see countries making good choices, some not. How can we work together, Christine, to, in this context of mounting debt, to get countries to ring fence the investments in people, in health, in education? How are we going to do this? We can advocate in, in our surveillance work and in our policy recommendations, which we find in the Article 4. But, you know, whether we get traction or not depends on the goodwill of governments, depends on the determination and perseverance of policymakers. Where we have traction and where I think we are, I hope, beginning to make a difference mm -hmm. is when we have programs in place. And I'll give you the example of Argentina, much talked about. Mm -hmm. In the Argentine program, we have a social protection floor. Mm -hmm. In other words, despite the fact that fiscal consolidation is going to have to happen in that country. There is a floor that protects social spending, particularly on the poorest and the most vulnerable. Mm. In other words, despite the fact that there has to be cuts, those ones will be protected. In addition to that, we're providing uh, a, bo a bit of a safety valve so that if the situation improves, then the authorities can increase the spending on social as a matter of priority. So that's a new, we haven't done many of that, but yeah. that, that's a new principle which I hope we can enforce. And that's why we have launched this commitment to reduce inequality index. We want countries to share the good practice yeah. for reducing inequality, to be in a kind of a competition to achieve higher and higher. An index is the good way to do it. Huh? Yeah, we think, we think it's going to do it. Let me ask you one question now about women's rights. I know you're passionate about women's rights just like I am. We are in the Me Too movement now that's focused on violence against women in the workplace. But I want to raise to you what I might call a legacy issue. Why? Christine, you're not about to go. No, 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 no. Neither am I. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're still here. But let's talk about this. It's a very long-term issue. This is the issue of how the economy is counted. Conventional frameworks have always underestimated, systematically underestimated women's contributions mm -hmm. to the economy. I'm talking about the subsistence work yeah. that women in Africa yeah. do, the unpaid care work all over the world done mostly by women, the community work that keeps societies safe and healthy and cohesive, all this is not counted in the economy, and it's mostly done by women. Feminists have raised this issue many times. The UNDP counted this in 1995, the year of Beijing, and said that the total unpaid work is equal to a half of global GDP, $11 trillion at that time compared to 23 trillion total mm. GDP. It's huge. I'm calling it a legacy issue. Couldn't you be the one who will push this and make sure that the world moves away from measuring human progress through mm. a narrow indicator mm. called GDP to measuring the economy and what is included and that's done mostly by women? Isn't this a shift that you could do from the IMF? I will happily participate in that movement. And I would do so particularly uh, because I have a little bit of background experience in that field. Because in 2011, mm. when France was president of uh, the G20, mm. uh, I launched, together with the President Sarkozy at the time, a, you know, a workforce that comprised uh, three um, Nobel Prize of Economies and a few other people to actually work on that, to identify for us how... The Sarkozy Commission. That, well, I think it was called eventually the uh, Stiglitz-Sen Commission. Yeah, that's uh, that, that's, I mean, these two participated actively and, and were very much uh, leading voices in that respect. And 
they produce together um, a report that identifies very clearly the unreported activity, uh, the value developed by women in particular, but by other people as well. And unfortunately, there was not much follow-up. The next G20 I've had other things to do, and, and uh, I think we need to just pick up that debate. And where I stand here uh, at the IMF, I think we need to go in the fields of data because what is unreported needs to be identified properly. We have a conference in November that will actually focus on available data, uh, how, you, how to account for those other economic activities and how they can be either included in existing uh, metrics or you know, treated separately but with equal regard so that we can really measure the contribution of women. I often refer to the example of you know, the gardener who does my garden, whom I pay and whose activity is reported in the GDP mm -hmm. and whom I eventually fall in love with and marry mm -hmm. and he continues doing my garden but his activity is no longer reported in GDP because I don't pay him. And the GDP falls. Yes. Absolutely. Until that work is counted and valued, women will continue to be a subsidy on the sure. economy and weakly located in... But they need to be their work and their contribution and what they do, whether it's at home, whether it's in the, in the, in the garden, or whether it's in community, has to be reported and we need to have access to data. What I hope is that, you know, with, with the availability of data, with good data mining, with, res with all due respect to privacy as well, we can better understand exactly what is being done, when, what value it delivers. I hope we, it can help. Christine, thank you so much. We see in you a strong leader. We follow you. We count on you to continue transforming the IMF and contributing to reshaping this economy so that it works for all people, men and women. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks.